I have given many presentations in conferences around the world, and this one today is special. Special because during breakfast this morning, I was reading the news as usual, and what I read this morning made me angry and sad. It made me sad that in the 21st century, in a country where I have lots of friends, um, <clears throat> people who are supposed to be role model for us uh, have decided to discriminate between humans, just for the sake of it. Before traveling to ELC, I have long hesitated on the attitude I needed to have in face of the political turmoil of the last few months. And this morning, I, needed, I decided that I had to build action on top of the anger, and that I could just not condone the situation by staying silent. I just want to dedicate this talk to all the people around the world who fight against discriminations of all kind. If I could not join them on Monday when it relied around the country, I want to show them my support and be part of the sea of pink that started marching on, the, on January the 21st. And so for them all, I have called out all the slides in this talk in pink. Thanks. So let's get started. We're going to talk about video encoding today. Video encoding is quite a complex topic. Uh, by no means am I today going to tell you that I master everything in there. So I'm going to give you a brief presentation of what's behind video encoding and how we need to support that in Linux, and especially in the Linux kernel and Linux user space. Um, a few, well, just a single rule for this presentation. You, if there's anything that's unclear, if you have any question, you can interrupt me at any time. If there's way too many interruptions and I see that, so, well, we end up being, getting late, um, I'll have to ask you to uh, hold the questions to, uh, for the end of the presentation. But so far, feel free to interrupt. Um, <clears throat> video encoding to start with. So what's video encoding? Well, really broadly speaking, from really high level view, <coughs> video encoding, that's a process of, uh, vid well, video decoding in this case first, that's a process of taking an encoded bit stream, so the just big bunch of bits, and turning that in uncompressed frames that can be processed, displayed, or used in general. That's really bird eye view of the topic. Video encoding is exactly the opposite of that. It's turning the, comp the uncompressed frames into a compressed bit string. There are many, many kind of video codecs, encoders, decoders. Um, they differ in many ways, but they all have a few things in common that uh, I'm going to try to explain first, because that's what we have based, uh, the APIs we have developed for the codecs on. So the first thing that's important to understand is the concept of a bit stream. So the encoded bit stream has a format that really depends on the kind of encoder you're using. So if you're using an H.264 encoder, H.265, uh, if you're using uh, VC1, VP8, VP9, AP1, all those codecs have a different way to format the bitstream. That means that there's very few, um, <clears throat> very few points that are common between all those different bitstreams, but one of them is that they can all be divided in packets. And <clears throat> we're going to see why that's important, but unfortunately for us, the packets don't always have the same size. Uh, they can be... The they can, they can have the same size depending for, for some of the codecs, but in the general case, they have variable sizes. So when you're lucky, you can easily divide the, the bit stream, the video stream, the compressed stream into packets. For instance, if you're streaming content from, from the network, um, usually we will have a network protocol that will packetize the data for you. So you will receive packets that are divided uh, and you will be able to, uh, to use that information in your decoding process. And that's not always the case. If you think about reading a bit stream from a file, from disk, for instance, uh, there's no packetization at the file level. So what happens is that the bit stream can encode packet boundaries. The way that's handled is also dependent on the kind of bit stream, the kind of video codec. But basically, um, there can be markers in the stream, there can be fields that allow the CPU, allow the system, to find the boundaries between the packets and then start processing the packets independently. Um, 
I'll concentrate here in this talk on the video decoding process because from a software point of view, that's the most difficult one for the APIs that we, uh, we have to, to that, that we care about today. Most of the information I'm going to give you also applies exactly the same way to video encoding. Um, I'll mention a few differences here and there, uh, but if I don't say anything, you can, uh, you can assume that's the same for, for the encoding and decoding. So the video decoder um, is a complex piece of at least hardware, and in many cases, especially when we're lucky, uh, of firmware running on a ded dedicated microcontroller that will just schedule all the process and control the hardware. Uh, I said when we're lucky, because having a firmware that having a microcontroller means that all the, all the processing required by the, by the decoder that can't be handled directly by the hardware, and one of them is passing the input bit stream here to find the frame boundaries and extract information from there that are not used directly by the hardware. When we're lucky, that's handled by the firmware inside the codec, so we don't have to care uh, from a CPU, from a Linux point of view. Uh, unfortunately, we're not always lucky, so as we'll see uh, later in this talk. <clears throat> so very roughly speaking, broadly speaking, uh, the video stream, I mentioned already that it contains information that can be used to detect packet boundaries, and usually it will contain information that's inten intended for CPU or microcontroller to process, uh, usually re referred to as headers. And then big green parts of data that's mostly uh, intended for hardware processing. It's important to understand that because when you don't have a microcontroller in your codec, when you just have the hardware pieces that are gonna process the green parts, well, you still need to do something about the headers and about all the information contained there. That's information that will tell you, for instance, what kind of resolution you're dealing with, very important to know when you want to locate your buffers and know uh, and, and, and want to decode uh, the, uh, your frames now. And then we'll code timestamps. Uh, the headers will also encode information about the content of the, of, of the different frames, information that's needed both by the application but also by the codec itself uh, to, uh, to, handle the, to handle the video coding and decoding process. So <clears throat> looking a bit at what's inside a video decoder, it's usually organized roughly again this way. So we have a bit stream that's the input, as I mentioned before, and decoded frames on the output. In between, we have first a bit stream parser. As I just explained, we need to, uh, we need to decode that bit stream, we need to split in packets, we need to find the headers. Uh, we need to take those headers and extract information from them to be able to configure the controller. Um, and we need to feed data uh, to be able to configure the decoder, sorry. We need to feed the encoded data directly to the hardware decoder and to feed information from the headers to a controlling process. Uh, one of the things that differ between the encoder and the decoder here, yeah, and that's pretty important as well, is that when you have an encoder, well, the process is pretty much the same but in reverse, so instead of passing the bitstream, you're gonna generate a bitstream. And once again, if you're lucky, you will have a microcontroller that's gonna do that in your codec, but that's not always the case. Um, but there's also more work involved in controlling the hardware in that case, because when you have an encoder, well, you want to optimize the process so that you get the smallest possible bitstream at the end. Uh, and depending on the, on the usage, you might want to rate control the, the bitstream as well. You might want to uh, make sure that your encoded bitstream will always fit in the bandwidth you have in the network, in the, the reserved bandwidth you have for the application. And so you need to do rate control. That means gathering information from the uncompressed frames uh, and trying to compute parameters to apply to the encoder to make sure that uh, we, we, you will fit in your uh, bandwidth limitations. So the controller can be simple, mostly simple for the, decoder, for the decoding case. We're just gonna schedule the, 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 um, the decoder and configure the hardware registers. But in the encoder case, there's more work involved there 
uh, and work where codec vendors usually think they have uh, added, an added value. So there's lots of heuristics in this rate control process. Uh, and when it's well implemented, you will make sure to have both the uh, highest possible quality uh, and the control bit rate. Um, <coughs> the decoded frames that are output by the decoder are also an input to the decoder because we're talking about video codecs in this case, not frame-based codecs, we're encoding a video stream, meaning that there's usually quite little changes between different frames. And, the, dec and um, the decoder to decode the next frame from bitstream will need to have pre previous decoded frames because the bitstream will contain differences, encoded differences between frames and that's for all frames, the full content of the frame. So there's Decoded frames need to be fed back to the decoder. They can't just be passed to the application uh, and, uh, and be left without, um, without being handled later by, uh, by the whole codec. Um, there are two categories of codecs, of video codecs. The first one is what we call the stateful codecs. Um, that's Roughly speaking, a hardware encoder or decoder with an associated micro microcontroller. That's going to handle all the bitstream passing for you, all the bitstream generation, the, uh, the bitstream rate control. All that will be handled by the codec. And that means we have, I mean, that gives a really simple situation. We have a piece of hardware microcontroller firmware that's a black, a black box for, the, for Linux that takes a bitstream at the input that passes the bitstream, uh, control the hardware, generates output frames, and keep track of those frames and read them back from memory when needed to uh, complete the decoding process of the, of the next frames, or the encoding process on the, in, the, in the other direction. That's when you, you're really lucky. Um, that's the architecture of the video codecs that we used to have, I would say, up to roughly f three, four years ago. We have several drivers upstream for that kind of codecs. Um, and there's a really good presentation here that was uh, given by uh, Kamil Debski, who was working for Samsung Poland at that time, um, using the Video for Linux API for those stateful codecs. So I'm not going to repeat the, all the content of that presentation. Um, but what's important there, it's, well, it's obviously my message to you today. Uh, is that the video for Linux API is the API of choice for that. Because everything you need to implement that kind of codex is upstream in video for Linux today. Because there are user space applications, there are user space middleware, thinking about GStreamer in particular, but not only, uh, that supports the video for Linux codec API. So there's no reason to use anything else. Uh, well, except if you just want to have a much harder life and. <laughs> I always have a, have a kind of soft spot for open Max. I haven't used it personally for codecs, but I had to use it for camera support quite a few years ago. Um, and at that time, so the, we, we had an open Max implementation. It was a big user space stack, two megabytes binary library uh, that was given to us by the vendor. And that was consuming lots of system memory, crashing all the time. And until someone in the company decided to get rid of that, replace it with a 50 megabytes uh, implementation, uh, 50 kilobytes, sorry, implementation with a um, very simple API and get rid of all the, the, the stack and the intermediate layers provided by the vendor. So I assume that on the codec side, it's pretty much the same. Uh, and really, Especially given that uh, Google systems, I'm thinking about Chrome OS and Android, uh, moving towards video for Linux for the codecs, there's no reason today to, uh, to use anything else in Linux. If you really want to support Windows, that might be a different story. So I mentioned video for Linux. I'm going to go briefly through the API. I assume that most of you have at least heard of it uh, or heard about video codecs, otherwise I'm not sure why you would be here in the first place. Uh, but I'm still going to present the, the API very briefly. So it, video for Linux is a really broad API. Uh, it can support lots of use cases, lots of different kind of hardware, uh, video capture for cameras, video output, video codecs. I'm going to focus on the parts of the API that are specific to the codecs today. I mean, so I'm not going to present anything that's outside of that scope, but remember that it's, there's more to video for Linux. 
than what I'm presenting here today. So video for Linux uh, is an API that's based on a device node. Uh, you have a kernel driver on one side, expose your device node to user space and user space application. Um, you open the device node, use your usual POSIX functions there, and a big bunch of IOCTLs. I'm not sure how many IOCTLs we have in video for Linux exactly today, but that's over 120. Last time I checked, I don't know, Hans, if you have the number, but there's a real large number of IOCTLs. For, fortunately for you, you don't have to use them all for the video codex. Um, so supported video codex with that, well, in the video for Linux API, we can split the IOCTLs in roughly uh, five categories. Uh, so we have all the configuration of the formats of cropping, composing, scaling, all that process. We have a bunch of formats defined for the codex today, H.263, H.264, VC1, VP8, VP9, a few others. We don't have support for all the existing video codecs right now in the sense that we don't have drivers upstream that for all the, the existing formats. Uh, adding a new format to Video for Linux is pretty simple. It's a matter of adding a new 4CC code and writing documentation for that, saying what it corresponds to. The reason why we haven't added uh, 4CC codes then and the format identifiers for all the existing codecs on the market today is simply because we have a policy that to have a format defined in the API, you need to have a driver using it. Otherwise, we get a proliferation of a bunch of formats that vendors think they, would, they, they need to use and later realize that they are quite pointless. We never get a driver for them, but we have to keep them in the API, and it's, uh, <coughs> it's really annoying. We have another set of IUCTLs that allow you to control your device um, and change all kinds of parameters. Um, I'm personally, uh, my, my first... Uh, First use of video for Linux personally was on camera side, so if you think about camera, you can control the exposure time of the camera, you can control the gains. Uh, for video codecs, you uh, will be able to control your bitrate, for instance, as I mentioned, you will be able to control a bunch of encoding or decoding parameters. So we have 260 standard controls last time I checked, which was a few days ago. Uh, we have many custom controls, uh, and adding support again for a new kind of video codec, video, <coughs> or video format, uh, will usually require adding control identifiers that are specific to that video encoder. There's a bunch that are generic, uh, but some are specific to each format, and those need to be, to be added. Again, the reason we ha don't have them now is exactly the same reason why we don't have the formats defined in the first place. We need to have drivers using them. But it's pretty easy to add. Uh, you send a patch that add a control identifier and a few lines of documentation to explain what it does. <coughs> then Video for Linux in the API has a bunch of IOCTLs to allocate and manage buffers. Uh, we support multiple mem memory models. We support buffer sharing using DMA buffs. You can share your buffers between different devices. And once you have configured your device, you have set the initial value of controls, allocated your buffers, then you can start your video, what we call the video streaming process. So streaming in Video for Linux means capture, means output, means encoding, decoding, so that's starting the hardware, starting the device. Uh, that's what we call starting the stream, and stopping the stream is basically stopping the device. So in between, well, you just go around and shuffle the buffers. You queue buffers to the um, to the device. Uh, for instance, in the decoder case, you're going to queue empty buffers that the decoder will need to fill with decoded frames. Uh, then at a later point, when they're ready, uh, you get signal that the buffer is ready, you dequeue the buffer, you consume the buffer, and then you give it back to the driver when you don't need it anymore. And it goes around that way. So that's roughly what a video for Linux API is about. Um, we have a framework in the video for Linux, in video for Linux inside the kernel called v 4 2 mem to mem The purpose of that framework is to provide you with a bunch of helper functions that makes it easier to implement memory to memory devices. So memory to memory device is a device that reads frame up from memory, outputs frame to memory. That's a typical use case for Kodak, uh, but could, that could be a uh, deinterlacer, that could be any kind of, uh, any kind of hardware that operates from memory to memory. So that hardware, I mentioned in a previous slide that we have a queue of buffers and we cycle around them. When you have a memory-to-memory -memory device, you need two queues of buffer. You need one at the 
uh, on one side, on the input side of the, of the, the hardware, and one on the output side of the hardware. The, the names are a bit misleading here because for historical reasons, they call output and capture. So capture is pretty easy to understand. That's when you capture video from frames from the hardware, they, they go from the device to memory. Output is a name that has been chosen from a video output point of view, from display point of view. So it means taking frames from memory and pushing them to the device. Unfortunately, in case of a memory to memory device, the output device is what's at the input of the hardware. So that's definitely confusing. Uh, if we could go back in time, we would, have called the, we would have called this display. And that would have been much easier to understand. But sorry about that. I can't go back in time. The mem to mem framework has an important limitation is that you're constrained to devices that produce one frame for every frame they consume. That's going to be the case of an image encoder, JPEG encoder, for instance. Uh, that's going to be the case of some video codecs, where you're going to give the codecs, well, not one frame, the decoder, for instance. You want to give the decoder one frame at the input. You're going to give it a bunch of packets from the bitstream, uh, and it's going to produce one decoded frame of the output. But in many cases, for the video codecs, that's not the case. Uh, you're going to feed your decoder with packets. And then the decoder will do nothing and will wait until it has enough data to start producing the first frame. Uh, same on the encoder, en encoding side. May, you, your encoder might need a few frames at the beginning of the stream to start producing the first piece of the bit stream. So the mem to mem framework is not always a good solution for that. That depends on what kind of codec you have. Um, an interesting thing about the mem to mem framework is that it supports in-kernel multiplexing of the device. You can have multiple use space applications opening the same device node multiple times uh, in two different applications. With each file handle, you're going to get two queues of buffer on each side of the device, uh, and it will operate completely independently. That's not too difficult to implement in the driver for a JPEG codec, for instance, where you basically have to just handle, uh, maintain con um, hardware context based on how many times you are, well, based on the file handles. Um, that's not mandatory. Your application, your, your driver doesn't have to support that, especially when you have a driver for a complex video codec um, where it would be really uh, costly to maintain all, all this context. <coughs> When we can't use the mem to mem framework, um, one option is to use two video devices. So two video device nodes exposed to user space. You still have a single device. You still have a single driver. But it's going to create two video device nodes, one, on the, one output device node that's the input of the device, and one capture device node that's the output of the device going back to user space application. It works exactly the same way. You have two queues of buffers. Uh, but this time, each is associated with a given device node. In this case, you can't, with the API we have, multiplex the device between multiple applications. So if you need to share your device, your video encoder or decoder between multiple applications, then you're going to need to implement that in user space. Uh, for complex video encoders or decoders, if you want to maintain real-time performances, uh, most of the time, the hardware will not be powerful enough anyway to encode or decode multiple streams at the same time with the same device. Uh, so that's not really an issue. Um, so the way it works is that, well, I showed you earlier how you're supposed to uh, use the video Linux API to control your device. Now you have two devices, one, on the, one output device, one capture device, and both need to be uh, handled exactly the same way. So you're going to set controls. Um, if needed. You're going to allocate your buffers. You're going to queue buffers. Again, it's the decoder use case. So we have encoded bitstream buffers, and we have decoded frames here. And then you're going to start streaming on those two devices, and you cycle around the buffers. There's a few pictures missing, because I was really upset with uh, LibreOffice this morning that decided to remove some of the pictures from the presentation. So try to imagine the cute little penguins here and here. Um, <laughs> Hopefully, it will still be understandable in the next few slides. If anyone wants to fix the bug, kudos to them. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, indeed, there's quite a few ones missing. Um, so an important thing about codecs is that when it comes to header parsing, well, you're going to feed a bit stream and encode a big stream to your decoder. You have absolutely no idea what resolution you're going to get out of that. So you can't, ahead of time, allocate buffers for the incompressed frames because you don't know how big they, they need to be. So that means that you need to feed your bit stream to the, to the decoder and start streaming on the, deco on, on, on the output side, the compressed bit stream side, for the decoder to be able to start decoding a bit stream and say, OK, that's a full HD bit stream. Then the driver will notify you. Uh, We'll have, we have an ICT and video for Linux that can be used to retrieve information about the video format, the video resolution. So the hardware is going to notify you. You're going to get the, the resolution, allocate the buffers, and start streaming on the capture side. So that's one thing that's specific to, uh, to the video codecs, is that you sometimes need to start the bit stream, passing the bit stream ahead of time. That was the stateful codecs. Any question until now? Yes? And it seems that you have to do a big format on the output stream and then apply the big format on the capture. No, on the capture stream. So on the output side, you're gonna start um, you're gonna start a stream on the output side. It's gonna start decoding the bit stream. Uh, then when it has enough information, you will do a get format on the capture side. Okay, so this is the first ICTL after open on the capture. Uh, well you can call other ICTLs on the cabin on the capture side if you want, but that's one you have to call before locating the buffers. Otherwise, you don't know how big, the, how, how big the buffers need to be. Yes? So the question is, when using a single device node uh, and still having two queues and not putting a capture queue, um, in queuing, dequeuing buffers, do we use the same buffers for the encoded bitstream and for the uncompressed frames? Uh, no, no, we use two separate buffer queues. So the IOCTLs in VideoFilmix that deal with buffers have an argument that tell whether they deal with the output queue or the capture queue. So that means that when you queue a buffer or dequeue a buffer, you can tell for which queue you want to do the operation. So that's two separate set of buffers. We don't, uh, we don't share the buffers between the encoded side and the, the decoded side. So now going to the stateless codecs. Well, they're much more annoying in the sense that, well, they're still hardware. If there's no hardware, we don't have any, any problem. We don't have to implement any driver, and I'm done today. So there's still decoding hardware here, but the hardware is pretty simple. It's going to handle all the heavy lifting, um, all the complex operations that would be really costly to do uh, in the CPU. But everything else needs to be handled on the CPU side. Um, as I mentioned, that's bitstream parsing. That's controlling the decoder itself uh, with all the parameters extracted from the bitstream headers. Uh, that's uh, bitrate control when you're encoding. So all that has to be done in the CPU. That means the Linux side. We don't want to do that in the kernel. Uh, we're dealing here with an encoded bitstream that you've downloaded from the internet. Passing that to a kernel driver unchecked and validated and expecting a kernel driver to be bug-free is a really, really bad idea. An even worse idea that I've actually seen in some implementations, hopefully they haven't made it to the market, is that people were concerned that the bitstream that you have here, so the bitstream can be encrypted. Uh, when you're watching Netflix, the bitstream you're going to get from the internet is going to be encrypted. They don't, want you to, they don't want you to have access to either decoded frames on the CPU side because you could capture them. It's really, really bad. I mean, it's kind of the end of the world in that case. Uh, but neither do they want you to access the bitstream after it has been decrypted. So encryption and decryption is usually outside of the scope of the codec itself. It happens beforehand. So that means that the bitstream that's in, sitting in memory somewhere can't be accessed by Linux. Um, on the decoded side, it's not too difficult. They have APIs where you can allocate memory that's not accessible by Linux based on the secure mode and the security level in which the CPU is running. 
uh, they, but the buffers will be shared with your display controller hardware directly, for instance, so the CPU doesn't need to touch them anyway. But here, well, the CPU needs to pass the bit stream, so the CPU needs to touch the, the decrypted content. And the vendors don't want to do that in, in, in Linux. So I mentioned that I don't trust the Linux kernel to do that job because of security reasons. They have moved the code to trust zone. So you have a trusted firmware running a bitstream parser and taking <coughs> unvalidated input from the internet. That means you pretty much you can you have pretty much have a guarantee that you have root well you have secure mode access to your device. It's very neat. Yeah, very useful. No, actually, it's very useful if you want to hack a device that's locked by the vendor. So maybe we should push them in that direction. <laughs> But if you want to have a sane design, uh, bitstream parsing and control of the codec should not be in the kernel. Another reason for that is that, especially on the encoder side, not really on the decoder, but for the encoder, I mentioned we have bitrate control. Uh, and many vendors want to keep that closed source. Uh, there's lots of heuristics. They have optimized the process. They're not compatible with opening that. So if it's inside a kernel driver, that's obviously an issue. And that's something we need to, uh, to push user space. How, how do we do that? Well, let's look at the interface of the real hardware, because that's the interface. That's the piece. That's the device that's going to be handled by your kernel driver. So it's that interface that will need to be exposed to user space. How do we do that? Well, at the input of the decoder, you're getting data that needs to be fed directly to the decoder. And possibly part of the header that is not meant for the controller, but that needs to be uh, sent to the hardware. Possibly other information as well. For instance, uh, mostly on the encoder side, you might need to pass big data tables to uh, control the encoding, the quantization process, and uh, make sure that you, uh, well, to make sure that we minimize the size of the bitstream. So it is video data that needs to be passed. And there's ancillary data that needs to be passed as well. One option in the video for Linux API that we can use is to group that in a single multi-plane buffer uh, that will use multiple planes for the different pieces of data that need to be passed. Those buffers are still uh, transmitted to the decoder using the QBuff, DQBuff, IOCTL. So everything that's in capital letters here is video for Linux IOCTLs. On the other side, with decoding frames, uh, please imagine that you have a cute penguin here. Uh, and again, we might need to extract information, ancillary information, metadata uh, that we extract from the, from the decoder or the encoder uh, that need to be passed back to user space, user space. And those can be possibly large quantities of data. Uh, in most cases, data that will need to be fed back with the next frame or with a subsequent frame. So again, we can use the multi-planner buffers that Video for Linux offer them. When we have control parameters that need to be set, well, we have control IOCTLs set and get controls that can be used to control the decoder from the controller running on the CPU. Um, depending on the new parameters, again, if you have, if with each frame you need to pass a data table that's 200 kilobytes, you don't want to pass that through the control API. It will be inefficient, so you need to pass that with the, with the buffer. If you have a few integers that you need to set and get, the control API is there for that. We have, as I mentioned, lots of video for Linux controls that, uh, are, that are defined, uh, especially for the codecs to uh, handle all kind of codec parameters. We can add more for the formats we don't support yet, but that's the API of choice. Um, the problem we have is that I mentioned that we have parameters here that are associated with the data inside a buffer. But the controls that we need to set and get, we also need to associate them with the either encoded or decoded buffers. <coughs> the reason for that is that, well, you, when you want to encode a frame, you want, want to say, I want to apply this exact set of parameters for that specific frame. The control and cube of the cube of IUCTLs are not synchronous to each other in video for Linux. So when you set a control, it's going to be applied immediately. When you have a queue of buffers, and you queue a few buffers ahead of time uh, to make sure that you will never run out of data to be decoded and to make sure that the, the decoder will always be busy, 
uh, well, it's pretty difficult to know when to call the set control of CTL to make sure it's going to apply to be applied to the right buffer. So for that, we have developed a new uh, API in video for Linux uh, called the Request API. And real high-level summary of that is that it allows you to group information, data, controls, um, frames, either encoded or decoded, and group that in an object called a request. So you build re your request, and you set parameters there. Um, the way it works is that we start by allocating the request, we set controls, we queue a buffer for that request, and then we end up queuing the request itself. So if you disregard the first and the last step, the intermediate steps, that's just two calls, but you might need to set lots of controls, so that could be multiplied by many. <laughs> Everything in, in the middle is standard video for Linux API. The way it will work is that if you don't call the Number, if you don't call number one and number four, well, all the controls will be applied immediately, and when a buffer is queued, it's going to be processed by the hardware at a later point when it, the hardware gets to that buffer in the queue. With the request, if you locate a request and set controls and queue buffer for the request, then those operations here won't be applied immediately. They will just, the information will just be stored inside the request object. That will then be queued for processing. Again, we have a queue of requests, and the hardware or the device, well, the driver in the first place, obviously, will go through that queue. And with each request that it proce processes, it will apply the controls to the hardware uh, and make sure that it applies to the right memory buffer. So that's how the request API works. Um, the request we have decided in a meeting we had in Berlin right after ELC, ELCE last year, we have decided to um, handle the request objects from user space using file descriptors, the same way that DMA buff using file descriptors uh, to, um, <coughs> to manage buffers from user space. We're going to use exactly the same mechanism. Uh, there's a few advantages to that. One of them, the, probably the biggest, is security. Because the first implementation of the request API just used an integer that refer to need to handle that refer to request, meaning that any user based application to just could just try to guess the uh, the ID uh, of a request and then add other parameters or get parameters from that request, uh, which was a security issue. So now we have file descriptors. When you allocate a request, it's going to create a request object in kernel space with a file descriptor pointing to it. If you close that file descriptor, well, the request is deleted and doesn't exist anymore. When uh, you have your, your request and when you have called the standard video for Linux IOCTLs with an extra parameter to specify that request, uh, and when it's full of configuration data, you can then queue that request. Uh, and the request will still be referenced from your file descriptor, but also from the queue of requests that are pending processing uh, from the hardware. Then you have two options. Either you close the file descriptor immediately because you decide you don't need the request, and the request is in a state where it's still referenced by the queue. And when the processing of that request completes, it's deleted automatically. If you need to keep that request around, well, at some point, processing will complete. The request will end up in a state when it can't be reused immediately, but it's still accessible from user space. Um, the reason for that is that I mentioned you can set parameters in the request, but you can also get parameters. So once a frame has been processed, once a request is complete, you might want to get information back from the, from the decoder, from the encoder that you will need to use uh, in, uh, in the controller. And the standard video for Linux CTLs can also be used on a request to get that information back. So that's why you want to keep the FD. Then you can then close the FD, in which case the request is deleted. But if you want to reuse the request, then there's a specific call called init. Uh, that's going to put the request back in a state when you can reuse it. The reason for that is that <coughs> requests are associated with a state of the device with lots of configuration parameters. Uh, when you create a request, it's going to duplicate either the existing state of the, devi of the device or at your request, or this, it's going to copy another existing request. So the alloc call has an option to copy an existing request or to duplicate the current state of the device. When you use a request and it gets to that state completes, and if you want to reuse it again, if you don't think about it, well, it's 
going to contain parameters that were applicable a few frames ago, but are not applicable anymore at that time. So you need to explicitly say, I'm I want to reuse the request and copy parameters, either the current parameters or parameters from another existing request. So you have to do that explicitly. And then you can loop around and reuse the same request all the time. We thought about not allowing that uh, and just mandating that request would be closed and requiring you to locate new ones. But that means that you could run out of FDs during uh, your video encoding and decoding process, uh, which was an issue. So um, we need to be able to allocate a bunch of requests beforehand and reuse them. So that's the pretty much all about the lifetime management of, the, of those request objects. Uh, I also mentioned that once a request complete, you can get information out of it, uh, controls, uh, all kind of data that you can get using the video for Linux API. So the request object will store that information. You can get it uh, using standard IO CTLs. So to uh, complete the previous diagram I showed, I have two extra operations here that you can use. Uh, to get information back and to dequeue the buffer, a buffer from the request. So you have queued an encoded frame and you dequeue a decoded frame on the other side. So it's all standard video for Linux, except that all the operations are done on those new request objects. Um, on top of your controller, well, you have your video for Linux application. All that lives in user space. You don't want to have the controller code inside the application because this is highly device specific. It's gonna use the video for Linux API, uh, but it will need to know about the way the encoder or decoder works to set the right parameters to pass it the right kind of data. And so you don't want to have all your video for Linux applications know about all the codec vendors. So that has to be split some way. So how do we do that? What API do we use here? I mentioned this is video for Linux. You have existing video for Linux applications that deal with the stateful codecs, as we saw before. Those applications use the video for Linux codec API. Because the controller running in user space here hides everything that's device specific, above the controller you have a stateful codec. The state is maintained here. So you want to reuse the same video for Linux applications you have used before. You don't want to have a new specific API here. So how do we handle that? Well, Fortunately, we have a use space library that comes to help. libvfile 2 is a very simple library that is basically a wrapper around the, the video for Linux, uh, either POSIX calls, open, close, IOCTL, and all of the individual video for Linux IOCTL. So there's gonna be a wrapper around that. You can either use it explicitly in your application, which is recommended, but if you have an application using video for Linux and not, uh, using uh, libv file explicitly, you can LD preload the library. And then the library will in intercept all the system calls, or well, all the function calls to the libc functions. Um, and then, well, do all processing it needs as if the application had called the library explicitly, and then use the system calls to interface with the device. So that's completely trans transparent. Even if your application does not use, uh, is not compiled for libv file, you can still use it. Um, libv file supports the concept of plugins, and that's something that becomes really important for the codex. So a plugin is an external library that can intercept all those calls, open, close, read, write, and the IOCTL call, uh, and all the video for Linux IOCTLs. So that plugin will be able to do all kind of processing specify, uh, required by the video encoder or video decoder. So that will be a hardware specific, device specific plugin that will first of all in intercept the format IOCTLs. So I mentioned that you can, with multiplane buffers, bundle video frames and metadata. You do, the metadata are needed for the controller inside the plugin, but they're not needed by the, the application on top of that. You don't want the application to see that. So those IOCTLs will be intercepted so that the application will think it's using an H.264 format, but behind the scene, that's gonna be converted in H.264 or uncompressed frame plus metadata. So going from user space to kernel space, the plugin will add support for the metadata, and in the other direction, it will remove it, so it's gonna be hidden from user space. 
We do exactly the same thing um, with the, the buff IO CTLs. Once again, I apologize for the missing pictures. They were still there when I checked this morning. Uh, and I will make sure they, they, they will be there in the slides, at, uh, the, the latest version of the slides I upload. Um, so all those IOCTLs that deal with requesting buffers, allocating them, queuing them, dequeuing them. At the output of a decoder, you want to get decoded frames in temporal order. You want to get them in the order that they will need to be displayed. The bitstream might contain the frames in a different order. So that means that the decoder is going to produce frames in a non-temporal order. The plugin can reorder that, can maintain buffers internally, buffer IDs internally, dequeue the buffers in an order that's known by the plugin, and then pass them back to user space through the dequeue buffer IOCTL in the temporal order expected to user space, by user space. Uh, allocating the buffers, to locate the buffers, you need to know the size, you need to know the number of planes, the same way that we intercept the format IOCTLs to add the extra metadata planes in the buffer. We do the same with the, the buffer-related IOCTLs. We also need to intercept controls because we have a bunch of codec-related controls defined in Video for Linux that are used by applications. Those controls could be exposed to user space, but that exists at a hardware level because they control the CPU, the, the, the control process that's running in, on the CPU inside the plugin. So when you get a set control call, you want to uh, use that value internally, but not forward it to the kernel. Some controls might want to go through. You could also have controls that are exposed by the kernel, uh, but that don't need to be exposed to user space because they're specific to your, to your device and they need to be handled by the plugin. So by intercepting all that, your device-specific plugin can hide controls or expose new controls to user space. A brief word about licensing and documentation. Uh, licensing first, well, a video for Linux driver, that's a kernel driver. Some people might disagree, it might be just a bit of a gray area, but basically that GPL. Uh, if, well, especially for upstream drivers, obviously. So from a community point of view, if you want to submit a kernel driver, that's GPL code. Libv for L2 in user space, that's an LGPL library. So that means that you can have a closed source user space application using it, no issue with that. You can also have a closed source plugin for your device. So if in your, especially for the video encoders, if you decide that you don't want to uh, open the code of your bitrate, bitrate control algorithm, that could be closed in the plugin. Obviously, the community will try to push to uh, have open source implementations here. Uh, and the rough consensus we have is that to accept a video for Linux driver for merge in the upstream kernel, we want to have an open source implementation uh, in user space that might not be the most optimized one. It doesn't have to have all the heuristics and all the optimized um, code for bitrate control, but it has to be something that's working. And then people can, the, a vendor, you, some, some other vendor can uh, distribute vendor-specific plugin here that's closed source that adds, well, that provides better performances, but it also means that if we have an open source implementation, we can, uh, in the community, someone might want to develop an open source alternative and optimize the code, uh, and in the end have a full open source implementation that might even be better than the one provided by the vendor. From a documentation point of view, I mentioned controls. Uh, I mentioned that we have metadata that can be associated with the buffers. The requirement uh, that we have if we want to define new controls is that they need to be documented. So you need a few lines of documentation explaining what they do. Uh, the metadata that you associate with, you, uh, with your bitstream or uncompressed buffers when you pass them to the kernel, the format has to be documented as well. What's next? Two things. First, finishing a request API. That's work in progress. Um, we have uh, had lots of discussions about what the API should look like. We discussed it with uh, Google in the context of codec drivers. Uh, and that's work I'm uh, personally doing at the moment. Uh, so I expect a new, uh, a new version of the, of the patches to be submitted around, uh, well, before mid-March. Mid -March. So that's one thing. The other one is that the request API is not limited to video codecs. I mentioned it can be used to associate parameters with frames. And there are many other use cases for that. One of them is implementation of a uh, Android camera HAL version three. Uh, 
where you need to be able to set parameters when you capture frames for every single frame. So the, the request API needs to handle that. Another one is performance optimization. That's something I'm working on with Renesas at the moment. Uh, we have memory-to-memory -memory hardware that needs to be reconfigured with every frame, potentially changing the size of the buffers. Using the traditional video for Linux API means that you have to process a frame, stop the buffer, uh, stop the stream, uh, allocate new buffers with a different size, restart the stream, process one frame, and repeat that. And that's extremely inefficient. So with the request API, we'll be able to associate formats and resolutions with every buffer, uh, and that would allow you not to start and stop the stream for every frame you process. So that's a very important performance optimization there. Any question? Yes? I'll give you the microphone, sorry. Thank you. You mentioned that the plugin will be able to intercept the system calls, and you mentioned that open, close, and write, and ICTL will be used. Yes. Uh, but some of the applications do use select, and it may have like FTs for different uh, uh, file descriptors. Like one of them yes. is a V4L to file descriptor, but others are like, so how do you handle that? So first of all, the application indeed you select or the pull system call uh, and use the video node file descriptors for that. Uh, as I mentioned, when you use video for Linux and yeah, libv file, you still have a kernel driver here that exposes the video for Linux API. So you should not have a kernel driver that exposes different API and other device nodes, because that's not video for Linux anymore. Uh, so if you still use the video for Linux API and use the same video node, then you shouldn't need to in intercept the select call. But there could be other reasons why you need to in intercept that. We don't support it at the moment, but the plugin API could evolve to add support for that if needed. So if, that, if, there's, if there are valid use cases for that, we can, uh, you can submit that, them to the mailing list and sum submit a patch, and we can intercept that system call as well. The, the typical usage for select is to block for the DQIO signal. So you, yes. ca you call the select and make sure that uh, at least one event is available. Yes. And only then you call the DQ. And when you call DQ, you expect that it will not block. Yes. So uh, in those cases, like when you are managing the decode order versus the display order, you may actually want yes, to. Yes, that's right. That's right. You might want indeed to. Uh, there might be a buffer available, but you don't want to pass it to the application yet. Uh, so in that case, indeed, that's uh, totally fine with, uh, with adding support for intercepting those calls as well. Thank you. Any other question? Um, you, know, you just mentioned about HAR uh, V3 interface uh, in Android. So I want to comment about you know, per frame control. So there is a uh, concept called group hold in a sensor. So if yes. you apply gain or exposure value, it doesn't take effect immediately. It takes effect uh, two frames later. Yes. So you, know, you might want to consider how you want to synchronize uh, DQ and also uh, external controls. Yes, so that's one of the reasons why we have a queue of requests. So you mentioned that indeed it, um, devices and hardware can apply the parameters a few, frame la few frames later after they actually send to the hardware. Uh, so if you, you need a queue of requests for that. You need to have at least two or three requests in the queue, depending, depending on the device, so you can send the parameters ahead of time to the device. So it means that your driver does not need to uh, process requests one by one without looking at the other ones. It can actually look at the whole queue and process some of the parameters in advance to make sure they are applied at the right time. You're welcome. Any other question? Uh, one common use of video decoders is for games, real-time yep. uh, game streams. So latency is going to be a really big issue. And latency can suffer when you have multiple buffers. How does V4L2 deal with that? So <clears throat> the more buffers you have, obviously, the more latency you have. Um, it's always a balance between making sure you don't run out of buffers and minimizing latency. So that's going to be, uh, that's going to depend on your use case. Video for Linux doesn't have anything that's specific to handle latency at the moment. Uh, but if you minimize the number of buffers you use to exactly what you, you need to make sure you don't have underruns, uh, then that should not be a problem from an API point of view at least. And the video for Linux would not introduce any extra latency. 
we can have issues when it comes to really low latency, especially in the, uh, the encoding side. You might want to start getting, uh, well, actually on the decoding side as well, you might want to start getting part of the output buffer before it's fully filled. Like you have a decoder, uh, you might say, okay, I know that it's gonna take some time to fill a complete decoded frame, but also know that the speed of my display controller is such that if I give that buffer to the display once it's filled at like two-thirds, I know that the display will not catch up before the, the decoder has time to, to finish the buffer. So you might want to do that preemptively. We don't have support for that at the moment. That's something we have discussed uh, before. Uh, ideas are definitely welcome. Uh, and I expect it's something we will need to address at some point. Uh, but we haven't yet. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I think it's going to be break time in five minutes, so maybe one more question if there's one, but you can always talk to me afterwards. So I've got the question about the request API. Yes. Um, I think I know that may be a sick question. So <laughs> um, the question is about passing the file descriptor of associated request to another process. Yes. Is it doable or does it make any sense to one process to prepare the whole processing and then pass the descriptor? It's and completely doable. So a <coughs> file descriptor yeah, in I know that we can integer, pass so you the can file pass it. That's not the problem. The, the technical, uh, does it make any sense uh, for one process to prepare the processing and then pass the request to another process? Would it be usable for, or? For Codex, I wouldn't think so. I mean, the API will allow you, you to do that. In many cases, I, I can't really think of a use case where that would be needed. Uh, but if you have any use case, that's totally doable. So I would try to minimize that because obviously even if it's doable, passing the file descriptor takes a bit of time. Uh, so don't do it just for the sake of it. Uh, but if you have real use cases, I'm totally fine with that. And how do, will it look from the implementation point of view? If I pass the file descriptor to another process, all the buffers which I submitted, uh, would be they internally in kernel, they will point to the same buffer or the yes. buffer will be copied? Yes, so the request object will contains parameters, points to buffers, uh, and all that is associated with a request. So if you can get hold of a request in a different process because you pass DFD, then you can get hold, you can read the value of the controls, you can override them, you can uh, interact with the buffers, you can do all that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, I'll let you enjoy the coffee and tea. Uh, and if you have any other question, feel free to talk to me either now, later today, or contact me by email. Uh, so in the uploaded slides, I have a few pointers to uh, resources, documentation about API, the presentation I mentioned about the stateful codec API, uh, and my email address. So feel free to contact me if you have any question, or the Linux media mailing list, of course. Thank you. Thank you.